has us um, smaller in number than we originally planned, but we're going to do what we came to do. And um, I'm going to record it for some of our community members, put it out on our social media. If you all are Facebook people or social media folks like I am, please um, post it, share it, uh, tag it, and record as many clips or information that you think is important for your community members to get. I want you all to please believe me. Um, because you don't see folk filling up these seats, it doesn't mean that they don't have the concern. And so I want us to realize that people may not be here, but people are really concerned about the company as a whole, the utility um, policy, not understanding it, knowing what it means. So we're going to give them information, we're going to get it to them, and we're going to give them ways to keep connected with us through the UAB. Since, and it was important, I love seeing members of the UAB here because we make recommendations that affect people's lives and it's great that we're all here to, to say why, why we make the decisions that we make, talk about the energy policy because we're the ones who pretty much wrote it. Um, and so we wanted to make sure people know the why and if they had questions, you don't have to get it from your Facebook friends or you know your neighbor that think they might know. You got the people here that run the business, you got the folk here that make the recommendation, that wrote the policy, to, and we'll hear from them. So I'm give folks time to get settled. I'm gonna grab me some water and we're gonna get started, okay? So, Oh, no, this you. is fine. And then also, when we're done, um, and I, I don't know, I might be speaking too fast. Yvette might agree with me. Y'all got family members and neighbors and places that you know. Drop them off some breakfast. All right? Drop them off some breakfast. I love when we have an opportunity to feed the community and just pop up to our neighbors. and you can. That'll be a good time for you to... You know, here's some breakfast sandwiches we had, and we talked about this, and this lady said you can call her if you want more information. You know what I'm saying? So we're not going to let any moment be wasted or any opportunity to be wasted. So that being said, I'm just going to get started. I want to introduce myself. My name is Carla Miles. I'm sorry, my name is Carla Lewis. <laughs> and those who know me already know I, I, I do that um, only when I'm talking in public. Other, otherwise, I, I know my last name. But my name is Carla Lewis. And I am a member of the Utility Advisory Board. And the reason why we're here today is because about a year and a half ago, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, we were working on this policy for a while. We started working on a uh, energy policy for the city at the direction of the city commission. That policy has a whole bunch of stuff in it, but there's a certain section, a couple of sections that directly affect the lives of people. A couple of those sections have been pulled out and put into this worksheet with the help of communications. Thank you so much. Y'all guys nailed it um, on what we're trying to do. So our subject for today is going to be energy conservation, the built environment, and renewable energy. And when you hear those words, they're general terms. We're talking about all the electrical vehicles. We're talking about ways that we can save and conserve energy. And we're talking about what our infrastructure looks like, right? And so we wanted to make sure when we had, when we first released the energy policy. The city of Gainesville and GRU did a good job of posting it on their website and sending it out, but it didn't get the engagement. One, it, was, it didn't get quite the engagement that we were looking for. Two, it, it didn't track originally the demographics of who was answering the questions, right? And that's important to us. We want to know who we're reaching so that we can adjust and reach out to other people, which is why Yvette was so generous with her time in helping me to plan something for our communities. And this is the first one, right? So we have another one planned. There's another opportunity for us to work the kinks out here and to, to do a, um, for me, a better job of engagement. And well, some things we can't, we can't overcome. Folks said they don't want to come out in the rain and it's too cold, ain't much we can do about that. And a lot of our neighbors in our community are elders. So they're like, my back already hurting and my knee already doing this. So I completely understand and I'd be great to, I'd be glad to take the information to them and some food. So I, that being said, I'm Carla Miles. I'm gonna give an opportunity for other UAB members to introduce themselves, and then I want GRU staff that's present to introduce themselves. So we'll start with UAB members. Starting with our chair. Good 
morning, everyone. I am Wes Wheeler with the UAB, one of Carlos' colleagues, and I really appreciate your being proud of the event of them. I mostly appreciate all of you coming out on a cold, wet, rainy, nasty day. None of us really want to be outside in, so thank you for coming out and participating today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Fultz. Um, I'm an adult education instructor. I work for Santa Cruz College. Um, I also work for the faculty union at UF, and I've got a, a strong background in labor organizing and environmental justice organizing, and that's what brought me to uh, the org. So thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Wendell Porter, past chair of the UAB, and uh, soon to be retired faculty at UF. Uh, my, uh, it's harder to get out of that place than what to get in, I tell you. <laughs> Right, and so we'll, we'll just turn to staff. We'll start this way. Sure, David Warm, the communications director at GRU. Your name is what now? David Warm. That's David Warm, and David is responsible for our publications, our information, our flyers, um, working with us to make sure that we pulled out information that was pertinent to our, our reason for being here today. So thank you so much, David, for your involvement on this project. Good morning, I'm Jim Joe Martin. I'm with uh, Energy and Business Services, GRU. I'm an engineer with that. So I work. Uh, my, my primary uh, work at GRU is with the net metering program, solar. Yes, ma'am. Hey, everybody. I'm Lisa Carter. Um, I work in the office. Can y'all hear me? I'll say that. I can't say that. I work in the office of inclusion are responsible for internally our inclusion, diversity, and equity efforts at the utility, but also um, externally we handle government affairs, we also handle community relations, community outreach, community partnerships, and community investments. That's a lot, so if y'all want to call Ed Belarsky and tell him I need some more money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm I love my job, I love my job. So, um, and I do want to take a point of per personal privilege and thank um, the members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, um, the Gainesville Alumni Lune Chapter, and um, the, the ladies of, of Theta Phi Beta Sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Chapter, because they came to volunteer for us today, and really, you guys are going to be our audience. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. community at large about something that they had no control over, but they were so graceful, they were so accommodating to um, the people. Couldn't really answer some of their questions, but they were really accommodating to getting them put to a place to where they felt comfortable enough to stay on the line, get get help from it. I listened to a couple of those calls, so your, whatever training that you're doing in there for them, 
And and I, I always tell the community, when you see our linemen and stuff, and, and go ease on them. That's why we have meetings like this, so that the leadership, we can come here, and then we don't just take this information. We want to take this information about the utility and take it back to our offices and to the dais and, and to Mr. Velarski and to Mr. Pope and let them know what is affecting our community. So this is not for naught. And I appreciate the customer service and all the staff members that, that are out there working, many who are going to be called in today because of falling down. i got a big limb on my roof. So they're quite busy um, right now. And so we appreciate you being able to handle that uptake in calls. Ma'am. I didn't, I, I didn't give my credentials at the beginning. I just said I work with the UAB, right? And so I am also a resident leader in this community. Um, I was instrumental in starting Greater Duval Neighborhood Association, which is a 501c3 that operates in this area. We just started a new business, a development company from that, that we're getting ready, that we're actually having incorporated as a 501c3, but the business is established and has a board. And so it's called First Community, Community Development Corporation. And we're going to be trying, we're not going to be trying to do anything. We're writing a housing program that I'm actually on myself, so it's working. And um, that will be a more equitable, pro equitable program and remove some of the barriers like debt to income ratio that we have. I, I have a high amount of student loans because I wanted to contribute to society, right? But it won't allow me to buy a house. So these are the things that I work with. The president of my organization is fixing coffee. When she sits down, we'll get, <laughs> we'll get started. That's Pastor Ernestine Butler under that mask and so we're going to get started for my work I work just giving her time to sit down so I've been involved I'm an emeritus board member with community weatherization coalition I serve on this UAB I'm the oversight chairperson for the wild spaces public places oversight committee I work with Grace Grove's food service project trying to um, get food accessibility in East Gainesville I am a member and advisory member for the partnership for reimagining Gainesville which is a uh, uh, which are micro grants sponsored by the University of Florida the city of Gainesville I'm an advisor on that project. I also serve with the city of Gainesville on the Food Service Coalition and trying to get a grocery store in Southeast. So those are a couple of things that I do. What I wanted to open up, um, and this is for anybody, I just wanted to, to go ahead because I, I had planned that I wanted to hear from people about their thoughts just about GRU in general. Because typically when we have these meetings, and that, that may not happen in this group, you know, but typically when they have these meetings, people have concerns. They want to talk about their bills, and they want to talk about all of those things. So I wanted to be able to allow folks that were here 
to voice any concerns that they have either personally or with the company as a whole so that we can get that information and we can take it back to the powers that be and it can be addressed. And they, when we take it back, it's addressed. You know what I'm saying? We don't hide from anything. I like to lay it out on the day as my colleagues don't mind talking. We have a lot of difficult conversations sometimes, but we always come to some type of solution. So is there anybody at this time that wants to speak before I call up my first um, expert? Um, anyway, I can't, okay, I can't think of the word I'm looking for now. But for some years now, I've been trying to um, convince my husband to get solar panels. And every once in a while, I'll see where the city or GRU has a um, program where they will um, help you pay in installments or, you know, help facilitate that. But when I make a phone call, I can never follow, I can never find the person that does that. Okay. So is that still something that's out there, the solar panels and, and that kind of thing? So who are my GRU experts can answer that question? She's had, she's seen advertisements from either the city or GRU or sometimes the advertisement suggests that your city or your electric company is going to help you. But it's about a solar program where she can get solar energy and pay in installments. And she wanted, she said, but every time she tries to reach out, she can never get um, any completion or any answers. So do we have a program like that within the city? I got somebody back there to well, answer. We actually don't have a program like that. We have a net metering program, and a lot of times I think those advertisements are, are generated by contractors who are actually doing it through financing. And they and they, off, they say, if I'm going to offset this electric bill of yours, you're just going to pay us a smaller amount of money, you're going to get most of your electricity from this PV system that we're going to install and we're going to pay for over the course of some time. So yeah, but there's no there's no real program within GRU to actually do on bill uh, financing. Like that. Do you that all is, have a program? Do you all have a company that you recommend? More, and I know that's tricky. But yes, you know. we don't like to steer business, and uh, so we. I basically tell customers I work with three main contractors here in town. They're all local. Uh, uh, Pure Energy Solar, Power Production Management, and Solar Impact. And the reason I tell them that is they've been here for years, mm -hmm. and we've, we're getting a lot of contractors that are coming in from out of state, Arizona and the like. Mm -hmm. And so they, um, some of them are promising the sun and the moon, and, and I, just, I just feel more comfortable telling them, I've worked with these local contractors, I know they're a, they're, they're good good contractors all in all. I don't hear any complaints against them. I can't tell you about any of these other contractors that are working outside of our, our, uh, our territory. Okay. Carla, I have a follow-up if I may. Okay. There is a state program called PACE, which isn't done that much here in the county, but it is available to Alaska County. And that is a program where you can finance it for your property taxes. And I don't know that it's really used that much. Jim, have you seen many people do that? No, not through our program. Through pace, yeah. So that that uh, I have done some work with solar co-ops, and uh, all three of the contractors that Jim mentioned are great contractors. Um, pace is available. Sometimes lenders don't like pace because they have mortgages or houses, uh, but there are there are good choices out there. Thank you, Wes. And I, I just want you to make sure that when you get this information that you also start like vetting the information, weighing out what's best for you. Be careful what you attach to your house because sometimes people in our community, I've worked with women that are uh, losing their houses just for a loan that they took out for something. It has nothing to do with their house. You feel me? And so when you work with certain companies, especially those that are used to acquiring mortgages through that means, you make sure that it's a program that you're able to um, afford and support, and that you have a backup plan for if you're not able, so nobody comes to take your house. Yeah. Okay. Um, you had a question, ma'am? Um, I did, and I don't know, maybe I should wait until hear um, from more of the presenters, but I guess I'm a little, um, you know, knowing that GRU was trying to build a solar installation in uh, southwest Alaska County near my home, um, and in order to provide uh, energy to whomever, because it wasn't our community, um, that, that you would not have some type of 
program that would assist homeowners in acquiring maybe solar panels or whatever to try to, ge to, to generate store or whatever the energy that you were trying to produce out west to ship back to these homes. So who would have benefited if not people who, I mean, yes, I know you can power the grid and all that kind of thing, but if someone wanted to acquire, you know, panels for their home to offset costs, because they are exorbitant, then why wouldn't you have some type of program that can meet people where they are? Like a community solar program? <laughs> that you're talking about when, when Whatever you would want to call it, but I'm trying to figure out why GRU does not have that. So, um, yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna try my best. When we have direct GRU questions, we're gonna have them answer our GRU staff as much as we possibly can. Yes, please. Okay, I can. And that's what I said. I could yes, No, no, no. You're fine. He, he's standing back here to answer your question. So there's a couple of things that we we'll look at when we we'll look at energy sources. Some of them is cost, benefit to, to the entire grid, um, and, and how we're gonna. So you mentioned programs for solar, for people to be able to get solar on their roofs. Um, and so GRU as, as general has kind of stayed out of that lane. The things that we have considered are something like community solar, where we would build a certain number of solar panels and people could subscribe to them and say, I want to own this many panels out of this, this, uh, this project, right? And so those are some of the things that we've considered, that we've put out there. Um, and as far as the, the, um, the project in, in the Southwest, that's actually something that, it's, a, it's an outside company that we contracted with to build that. So they're gonna build it and we're gonna buy the power from it, okay? And so that's how that arrangement works. Outside of us buying the power, all of the decisions on where and how and who builds it and all that stuff, that's on that third party company, okay? So when, we, when we're doing that, we're looking at how much is that power going to cost compared to what we're producing, and how is it going to affect the electric bill when we start to bring that down? So there are some other opportunities for extra pro for other programs that we can look at and evaluate. Some of them we propose, some of them we're still studying. Some we're looking at, and, and as technology evolves, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in my piece, as technology evolves, your options also change as well to be able to meet some of those. Um, so we're constantly looking at those things, constantly looking at what's going to be the best benefit, not only for individual customers, but for the utility as a whole. Okay, so with that being said, what have you come up with? So, there's a number of things, like community solar, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, and this might not go over well, but ultimately the city commission has to give us permission to do that, right? We've got to study and, and have the costs and the impacts. We've got to study to make sure that it's not going to have an adverse effect on the rest of our system to raise costs somewhere else, even though it looks cheap here, but to raise costs here, that's not really a benefit to the customer, right? As far as solar in particular, and, and people going into and putting solar panels on their roofs, we've had a general policy to not go into that financing side of it, right? We have a, we have a program to help accept it onto the grid to give you credit and pay for that, but we, we don't have really a program to go into that financing section, right? So that's gonna to have to require a change of philosophy for the utility itself to move into that financing on and take on that risk, because that's extra risk that we have to take on. If we take it on, in turn, the customers take it on, because ultimately they pay for that risk, right? So as we look at those things and start to balance them, those are the things that we're considering. But I guess I don't see it as a risk. But, I mean, now to me it's a sound business decision and a sound environmental, you know, it's out of the, it used to be where, oh, only rich people or only people who were out there had that solar stuff, but now it's like, it's here, and we know that it works, and it should be um, the norm more than not. Right, and so that's why we have this program to accept that power and that energy. But when you think about putting some roofs or putting panels on somebody's roof, right? That person is taking some risk to put those panels on your roof. There's a financing component that does come with the roof, that risk. What if they default? Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to recoup the cost of that that we now outlay and they default on, the, on that financing part, right? So those are all considerations and, and levels of risk that we take, uh, take into account. Sorry. Yeah. Carl, if I may. Yeah. Uh, 
We have the, I'm with the League of Women Voters, and we have organized what are called solar cooperatives. Where we all get together and make the cost much less, buy it in bulk. Uh, we've had two cooperatives here in town. We don't have one in now. We may have one in the future. That's one of the things we're doing. It's important also to point out Jim's program, Net Metering, because Net Metering is a great way for you to pay for your solar panels. Because you use, you're buying less electricity from so Jim, the, Jim's going to cover it. Jim's the speaker. So don't, okay, I'll let him don't get too that. deep. Yeah. Don't get too deep. That, that, that's a great program. I want to stop. I want to hear from staff as much as possible. And mostly I appreciate you bringing this up because I'm going to be bringing this up for the UAP, that the city get more involved in you know, not subsidizing, but promoting solar power and conservation. And I really appreciate you asking those questions. Thank yep. you. Um, I'm going to take your question, and then I'm going to, I'm going to put my two pennies in now. Okay. okay. Go ahead, baby. My question is related to uh, the community solar. Uh, I'm a community solar person. Uh, we have And I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add in um, my part as far as a dynamic, because a lot of times we hear questions related directly to GRU about why they won't do this or why they won't implement that. They only work at the direction of the city commission. So in order for us to advocate um, properly, then we have to show up to these city commission meetings and ask them why they're not directing GRU to do certain things. Another thing I wanted to add, I see your hand back there. Another thing I wanted to add was this dynamic, and this is with any business. So if you're a business owner, you understand this dynamic. We would love to change things overnight and make them better for our customers. But at the end of the day, a large portion of energy conservation and a lot of these practices is going to work, right? And so that is going to lower a lot of our revenue. Right, And so the city commission then is in a position to figure out how do we balance this because GRU profits goes to the city. See, that's that little dynamic that we don't talk about when we wonder why things are not moving as fast. Because now I have to figure out, and I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate on both sides. I'm not saying one is right or that I understand it all. I'm just telling, laying out the dynamic. So now if I'm a city commission, I got to figure out, if I do this like a community-wide, one, I got to pay for the infrastructure, right? Because you guys are not going to pay for it. You're just going to subscribe to it. Now, if I pay for all this infrastructure, like say we're going to do rooftop solar. If I pay for all this infrastructure and you got a bad roof, you ain't going to be able to participate. So now my concern is, do I give you solar or do I fix your roof? You feel me? And then now I have all this infrastructure that I'm paying for, and I got to pay for the maintenance and all of that, but only a few people are um, subscribing to it at a time. So now I'm taking a loss. So if I'm taking that loss, I got to try to make up that money, which means I'm coming right back to my customers. And so before they make a decision, and I tell people, I, I, I want to encourage folks to talk to the city commission. And you, can, you know you can meet one-on-one -on -one with any one of them at any given time. So talk to them. And, and, and find out how we can move this stuff forward. 
without it coming back to haunt us. Because that's what he's essentially saying. We can't move fast on it because then we get in the tail. My grandma used to say, take care of it in the front so it don't stick out in the back. Because we get to the tail end of it and we have people in worse shape than they started. So when we start pushing, and I tell my community, when you start pushing for things like solar, and I love exactly what she said, because the battery back at the solar is one thing, right? But like today, we would have all been in the dark. And we've been trying to figure out how to, how to back up. If you ain't have no battery and you was 100% solar, where are you going to get your power? And so I'm quite sure as backup options, can we afford them? Are they also as cheap as the panels are getting? And so those are some of the questions that we need to answer, Ms. Albert. And so I first felt the, the inconvenience on the 45 minute wait. And then I just jumped in the car. I was 10, 15 minutes away. So I get there, say the name of the person I'm paying the bill for. And they say they don't take debit cards. However, the lady was so nice that she ended up writing the account number on the card and said, call this number. But how could that process be streamlined to where anyone can make a payment using any platform anyway? So I, I can address that. So one of, one of the things that we have in our system, and I, and I guess I would call it a shortfall, is the system running per, running customers' credit cards through the system is just not a no-go with the system that we currently have. We're in the process of going to an upgrade, so hopefully that the system will be a lot better. But as it relates to calls, of course, it's really busy at this time. It's a lot of people calling, um, especially with the rates being impacted. So we have a lot of calls coming in. So coming in sometimes after sometimes. Um, but as it relates to making payments, it's easier to do it online. And so that, that's the process. So the, the credit card that actually comes through our system, it's actually you go online, you make your payment, and you go that process. And also, you can make a payment uh, without having to talk to someone. You just actually hit the payment, and you can actually go directly and make a payment from that point. So it's just a way the system works. We can't take um, customers Okay, so um, in the system, can you pay with a debit card, or do you have to have a we don't, we don't. check card? It could, it could be either or. The, okay, the third party, the third party would be able to take that. Right. Okay. And the thing was, I wasn't paying my bill. Yeah, I understand. Right. I understand. Right. I'm just wondering if it didn't take debit at all. Under, you know, of that. Yeah. Matter. So, so if, if I wouldn't pay David Moore to get into this information, I could just get that free pay. Yeah. So um, I could get information. I could go online. to the solar panels, like are you looking at what other cities have done successfully, what the goal standard is across the board for all cities? So that's a good question, um, and I'll tackle the solar part first. Um, solar technology has evolved a lot since the beginning, right? And so as far as a gold standard goes, there, there's everyone that's buying your panel will get kind of the same ballpark as far as efficiency, cost, mm -hmm. that kind of the issue is now tying that back into our system. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the point of a battery or a backup, right? You know, a lot of folks are saying, well, let's go 100% solar. Well, on a day like today, if there's no battery backup, guess what? We're rotating breakers because we don't have anything else, right? If we go 100% solar and nothing else. So there's always a balance as to how much we can add at a time to make sure that on days like this, sunny days that we have enough backup to where if something happens, we can still cost effectively serve our customers, right? So those are all the considerations. Is there a gold standard as far as how much? Um, you'll hear some industry numbers out there, you know, 10 to 15, 20%. If you go battery backup, you can go higher than that as far as your overall system. But it all depends on your size system, your makeup, where you are, what you have to do. 
So the gold standard, and I'll, I'll address this a little bit, um, a lot of utilities, and we do study and benchmark for the utilities, a lot of utilities like the city of Gainesville are going uh, net zero, right? Which is basically they're, they're saying you can't emit by more than you can offset as far as emissions go. And so that's kind of the gold standard or the goal that everyone has set. The issue is there's a lot of different ways to get to that answer, right? There's a lot of different ways. Uh, in different parts of the country, they have wind available. Do you know how much wind we have in Florida? Zero. Other places have, have uh, hydro, right? They have mountains and rivers and it flows downhill and they can create power almost instantly. Do you know how much hydro we have in the state of Florida? Zero. And so those things are, are considerations. For us, we have that challenge where someone in, in Missouri or someone in Northern California does not have, right? That's a challenge they don't they don't have. That's another tool that they have in their tool belt to kind of meet this this need. And so, when you say gold standard, it really all depends on what kind of tools you have in your tool belt and how you mix them together to answer that question. Right. And thank you so much. And before we um, go further, we're going to call out our speakers because I noticed that these topics are kind of, and the questions are kind of crossing topics, and they may be answered by um, them. So, John, 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 come on, baby. I was just going to ask a follow-up question to one of the questions that was asked, if that's okay. Is that all right? Okay, so uh, the, John, is kind of the payment options question. Um, I, was at a, I was at a conference this past summer, and it was the American Public Power Association Conference, which is all these municipal utilities all over the country. And one of the uh, utilities there gave a presentation about um, where they're moving in terms of payment options, and they're actually moving even towards allowing people to pay with, with apps, like, like Cash Apps and Venmo and Zelle and things like that. I was wondering, with this yeah, new third party yeah, system? Yeah, so, so we're definitely looking at other options to make payments. Um, and, and I'll use this as an example. You, you, you've heard our slogan that there's no line online. Um, we're really trying to go into the apps to where you don't have to wait in line to make payments or get certain things done, which I think is very beneficial um, going forward. And um, just there's different places, even as it relates to making payments, you can go to Publix to make, make payments, you can go to different places. Um, we're, we're really trying to expand our um, options as it relates to payments. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over So um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the rental housing ordinance. It's uh, kind of a shift of gears from GRU. Um, I'm with the general government side, but we work very closely. I've been working with Ken Don, for instance, for many, many years. It's been, I was thinking about it walking in this morning, 15 years or so since you were building your house in the, in the county. Um, but mostly on the new construction side and that sort of stuff, so I already told, you know, kind of how I ended up here. But the, uh, the rental housing ordinance recently passed, um, or, or recently came into effect on uh, October 1st. It was passed a couple years ago. Uh, they assigned my overall department, Department of uh, Sustainable Development, to oversee it, and it's housed in codes enforcement. Um, essentially what the idea as far as energy use is to be able to approve the the energy efficiency of our existing housing stock. Um, you know, and Gainesville's a, a college town, so we look at other college towns, but Gainesville's a good bit different than a lot of other college towns in that it's a city in its own right. All of our rental housing stock is not necessarily student related and that sort of thing. We've got the big apartments and, and and all that stuff that's really close to campus that's mostly student affiliated, but a large percentage of our population lives in rental situations in houses, in actual standalone houses, and a lot of our housing stock is older, uh, duplexes, single family dwellings, a lot of uh, even historical houses that were converted to um, essentially apartments, quads, duplexes, things like that over the decade, and that tends to be where a lot of folks live that have uh, a problem with neat weatherization, needing to improve their energy. One of the things I think that, uh, that, you know, in the commission meetings that they talked about a lot was the overall cost of ownership, uh, you know, largely being based on your, your energy use. That your rent could be fairly inexpensive, but if your utility bills were high, you know, how to address that. 
And so the program that's enacted is, uh, it's essentially a code enforcement program. But to, to meet its goals, it's going to require some efficiency upgrades on the part of landowners, um, you know, homeowners, um, rental housing owners. Uh, it sets a few minimum standards. It's not saying that you're going to take an existing house and bring it up to current code for efficiency, but you're going to be putting some insulation in if you have the room to do it and the availability to do it. Uh, it prescribes um, low flow shower heads, uh, low flush toilets, that sort of thing. Um, to get a little background on like water usage and, and, and you know, current code for a, a flush toilet is 1.6 gallons per flush. Up until like the early 90s, it was five gallons. So it's a tremendous difference. Um, and I don't, you know, if you've ever seen like the way the new uh, toilets work and that sort of stuff, they get the same flushing power through better design, better, better efficiency. Uh, low flow shower heads the same way, you know, it's made uh, using a lot less water, but it's giving you a much higher velocity. So just different changes. Those are changes that I, I think the commission felt were reasonably achievable, pretty inexpensively, that made a big impact. Another thing that, that make a big impact is just weather stripping. Uh, you mentioned the weatherization coalition and that sort of thing. There was a, a tremendous amount of energy behind that at first. But at some point, I guess, if you don't sort of regulate that, then you, you, know, you have people who just opt not to participate. Uh, and you can get a lot of bang for your buck by just adding some insulation, which is relatively inexpensive. Uh, sealing AC ductwork. You know, any AC duct work, no matter how well it's done and put in, over time, the tape gives up, the joints give up, you leak. If you leak into an attic in Florida and you're just, you're running your, your AC the whole time, you're not getting any of that, but you're still using that in a, you know, spending a little bit of time and effort and labor on sealing and taping duct joints can make the comfort of the, of the home so much more, so much better and make it where your thermostat will shut off. Uh, the program that's in place now has a escalation essentially to require a insulation in attics to be upgraded to R19 by October 1. Um, it'll go to R38, I think it is, on October 26. There's some other, uh, 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 2026. In 2026, there's some other requirements that kick in, like programmable thermostats and some different things that are not easily achievable right off the bat because, you know, if I've got an older AC system, I can't really put a programmable thermostat on it and make it work right now. So there's some, some things uh, like that. And a lot of my, just to talk about my personal involvement in it, was a lot of looking at what's technically feasible and what's infeasible. And that is, you know, like, hey, let's go get the building official and ask what we're going to do if we can't do this. You know, if you've got a low-slope house that has no attic access and no way to blow in extra insulation, then you can't do it. There are other things you can do, ceiling doors and windows, weather stripping, and this kind of stuff, but you can't just go blow in insulation and improve uh, the insulation in an attic if there's none there. So that's a, that's a technically infeasible type, type call, that kind of stuff. Yes, ma'am? Yes, ma Power questions, I'm out of stuff to say. No, you're good. <laughs> at the commission level on what to do with the, with the COVID yeah. relief money. Yeah. Um, there again, like I said before, you know, we really don't have the authorization to say, hey, we're going to go look at this program or that program. We rely on the commission to drive that, and we rely on y'all to drive the commission to, to point us towards those directions. Absolutely. Um, there's, 
there's a lot of talk about different ideas that we've seen and heard, you know, those of us have to go uh, in front of the commission about what to do with the COVID money and, and that sort of thing. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for citizens to put in on where that should go and where that should be driven. And those, sure. com those conversations are being had like, right now, as like, a matter of fact, they, they come up and fail. And a lot of the conversation has been around before even addressing, that's why I wanted to give that dynamic at the beginning to let you know that, again, a lot of these decisions have been driven by the city commission. And so you have commissioners, not ours, but you have commissioners that want broadband, but haven't made sure that all children have computers. So, I mean, you have to pay attention to the general government side as far as the city commission and realize that staff, be the city, GRU, or whoever, they take that direction from the commission. And if we don't tell the commission what we want them to do in our community, they make their own decisions. Based, and I don't think they're doing anything ugly. They're just making decisions based on what they know because they don't hear from us. Well, well sometimes they do, and they still make Exactly. Yes. Like said, you said you wanted to have some more of these particular forums. Why aren't they here? Why aren't commissioner, commissioner representatives? So they were invited. Okay. Okay. So and, and, and again and again, we're GRU, right? I got it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I want y'all to please. No, but check. I think we needed to hear that they were invited. That's oh right. yes, ma'am. Oh That's yes, ma'am. We always as a community. We we always try to send out invites. I can yeah. tell you personally. Um, and this is not trying to protect one commissioner against the other. Um, typically when we schedule things like this, we try to schedule so that the community can be here. And now that we have a, a beautiful commissioner that also works at a funeral home, this is one of the biggest times. And so she tries to get every event that she can. This one, um, and this was our first, we, were, we wanted to stay on schedule with having it. We realized that the timing was a little bit short for this one but the next one we'll start advertising and posting and, and then seeing what different commissioners so that we can notice the meeting. Because we have to notice these meetings for Sunshine. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. And we'll take more of an effort to do that. But I think it would be beneficial if they could hear first. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and at least designate someone for all of them. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely Charlie, right. Charlie, if I may follow up. Yes. It's great. I mean, that's really what we need to do is be directing our conversation to the commissioners. And two programs in particular, that I think we really should be talking about is the Community Weatherization Coalition. Mm -hmm. Several folks here are with them. And the GRU has a conservation program as well. So if we can encourage our commissioners to increase funding for CWC and for the for GRU's conservation, Absolutely. that would be a wonderful thing. Because they're the ones who make the decision. Yes. Absolutely, ma'am. I have two questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You said uh, there's a mandate now for R19 installation. So is this for a new build or uh, old homes, rental versus owners? How it it would be for a rental unit to be brought up to a minimum of R19 in the attic if that unit is being rented out. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, there was a couple of articles recently um, regarding utility usage and uh, if I'm quoting correctly, the average home owner pays 5% of their utility costs 5% of their income for utility costs, whereas in certain pockets, and I do have a graph where it outlines the high cost, the high, maybe consumption and cost areas, I'm not sure. But these people are paying 22% of their income. And typically, they're the lower income folks paying 22% of their income for utility, more than likely because of what you're talking about, renting, poor reservation, poor uh, appliances in the home that aren't energy efficient. Multi-generational families. Most Absolutely. Of us have more go on and on and on. Yeah. So with that, knowing this, knowing this type of information, because um, I thought, I think you said that it's not like it's, it's an ordinance, but it's not a requirement, but you're hoping that people, the renter, I mean the homeowners who are renting will do some of these smaller things in order to... Well, it's it's an ordinance. So, so, so they, it, they, it they is, have, it, it's question. a mandatory, uh, if you're reading it, then then that unit has to meet these, these other things. And it also encompasses some things not related to energy efficiency, like minimum housing standards, you know, no rotten floors, mm -hmm. uh, working hot water, all kinds of uh, different things that just address basic livability, which is uh, equally an issue. 
Um, I don't know about the numbers that you quote, but I think that this rental housing program is largely intended to address that, to essentially mandate that, uh, that landlords upgrade their properties a little bit to make it more affordable, uh, because the tenants who's paying the electric bill. Thank you so much. We appreciate your input, and thank you all for those awesome questions. These are some great questions, and you're right. One of the things, like um, our chair Wheeler was just talking about, one of the ways that we do try to address that now is through the Community Weatherization Coalition. I've been volunteering with them for some years, but again, um, what we add to the home is all dependent, I mean, how many people we can serve and all that depends on our budget and what they're putting into it. And so as you're talking to the commission about what we can do um, to use the funds. I know that they looked at doing seven million dollars into nonprofits, and so asking them, but they, they didn't clearly define as to what that would be going to. Just that they would serve that amount to spend on nonprofits. That may be a good opportunity for us to push them to fund more um, CWC activities, so that we can address them. Because as an auditor. When I go into these homes, it's just like you said. If they're paying 22% of their income on utilities, I can guarantee you it's a grandma with her grandchildren and her children, and you got three deep freezers in there because there's a lot of people in the house, and we got a refrigerator, we got a hot water heater 15 years old, we don't have new windows. We have a whole lot of issues in these houses, and until we can fix that, and that's one of the reasons why when we talk about solar and renewable energy, we realize that we are not able at this point to bring everybody along. So we got to figure out how do we get everybody healthy so then we can move into renewable. You know what I mean? And that's the feat and that's where some of the time is coming from in making these decisions. Oh, I left my paper over here, my cheat sheet. And I think Jim is next. Net zero, come on Jim. But thank y'all so much. I like this before I leave that today. I, we recording, so I go back because I'm going to jot these questions down. And, and even with my commissioners, I'm be like, we need to answer these because some ladies are on their game. Okay. Did you have a question, Mark? I on the news, too. <laughs> uh oh, I'm sorry. So, Jim, I'm going to let Jim speak, and then I call my mama watching the news, and then I'm going to have, um, we'll have, have some more questions. Good morning, I'm Jim Gil Mark, and I work with Energy and Business Services, the GRU Department, set of conservation services. It used to be called Conservation Services. It's now called Energy and Business Services. We do all the DSM programs, the demand side management programs. In utilities, you can basically take energy management and break it into two parts. One is, uh, is the supply management. That's taking the operation of the plant, the distribution system, the buying of the fuels. And on the other side, you've got the demand side, which is sort of from the customer's perspective. If we can decrease the usage, we're mitigating the supply problem, right? So we, we look, we're looking at programs that actually modify customers' behavior or uh, reduce their energy usage. And we have a number of programs that do that. Uh, traditionally, it's been broken into two parts. We have the energy efficiency appliance programs. That is for, um, say, if you go out, we'll incentivize the purchase of a high sear HVAC system or a, a high efficiency refrigerator or pool pump or the like. Um, and the other part of that um, of demand side management might be demand response. That is, we try to modify your usage of energy, either decrease it or have you use it at a different time. And that's going to be important as we go forward because we're going to have AMI out there, right? We're going to have meters that will allow us to set rates at different times of the day. And if we can encourage people to use their electricity at night, say, take for an example a, a woman that owns an electric vehicle. She's going to come home from work at 6 o'clock. She's going to plug in her vehicle. We don't really want her to do that. At 6 o'clock, that's our peak time. That's our, it, that is when we're spending the most to generate our electricity. And um, we would prefer her to, to, to wait and then use that electricity at night. So how do we do that? Maybe we encourage her through a time of use schedule. We say it's cheaper to use electricity at night. 
So basically what I'm saying is basically in demand side management, there's two sort of arms that generally uh, uh, address this. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about what we're doing right now through our department. We, uh, we do a what's called an energy survey. We do about 1,200 of these every year. We'll go out to a business or a home and we'll actually look around. We'll go there with the, uh, the consumption history. We'll uh, recognize where they're using most of their energy and we'll provide them with recommendations on how they might reduce that use of electricity. Uh, those energy, we've been doing uh, energy surveys for, for many years. They're, they're, they are a prime uh, part of our department and one of the most, uh, I think, successful programs that we have in, in place. We find that a lot of people just don't know how to read the bill correctly. There'll be calls out for an electric, an electric bill when in fact it's a high water bill or something like that. So it's really an educational outreach, the energy survey. The uh, program that I'm presently working in is called net metering. Uh, I think Wes Wheeler was talking briefly about it. This allows our customers to invest in uh, PV solar, put it up on their roof, and they can offset some or all of their energy usage. Uh, what, what is night, the way it works basically is your, your system is gonna be generating electricity. That electricity is gonna go into your breaker panel, your distribution panel. If you have any electric loads in the house, that electricity will address those loads. Well, sometimes you're generating more electricity than you actually need, so you need some place to store it. And instead of making the big investment and a very expensive investment of batteries, GRU is acting like the big battery. We will store it for you. We'll give you full retail cost for everything you push on. You can take it off later, say at night when you're not using, when you're not generating electricity. And, uh, and it's at the same cost. So basically we have two registers on one meter, measuring how much you pull off of the grid and how much you push onto the grid. The difference between those two numbers at the end of the billing cycle is going to say whether you've got energy credit coming to you or whether you uh, had to augment your system with energy that you purchased from GRU, in which case you're, you're buying it at the same rate. Uh, that's our net metering program. Uh, allows customers to come on without without batteries. Go ahead. I'm, I'm going to stop right there. Are there any questions? Because that's a lot of information. Anybody have any questions? I have one back there. Is there a difference between placing a solar panel on the roof versus next on the ground, probably next to a property? Is there is there some difference with that? Because I keep hearing the roof, or is the roof just the best recommendation? The roof is where people have most of the area and they don't want to start taking up because most of us have small yards, don't want to start taking up. But if you have a big field out there and if it's the same parcel, that is you're not wheeling it from one side, from one parcel to the other, you're, you're more than welcome to put it at any place you want. Yeah, no difference, no impact on the efficiency of the modules either. Yeah. Uh, my question, uh, and I may be getting into uh, Meters, when you were talking about these meters, I'm, I'm an old resident and um, homeowner. Uh, the meters, are they ever, the meters that we currently have, are they ever monitored, upgraded, checked? I mean, just the other day, the guy was out there using it, but I mean, how can that help us as far as old homeowners? So, and when you talk about the comparison to the meters that you were talking about, yeah. The AMI meters. Right. Yeah, we have a program, we switch out meters as they grow older. Um, generally speaking, those disc meters, they slow down as we get older, so we're losing revenue, so we want to keep up on that. But you can always put a, a known load on a, on a meter and measure, and we, we can look at it in real time and measure whether it's accurately measured. If you feel like it's not accurate, energy that you're receiving from GRU, you're welcome to call up the metering department. They do test these meters, and, uh, and, they get, and as long as they're within tolerance, they'll, they'll let it go forward. Oh, okay. and if you want Did you have a question, Daniel? Yeah, I, I had a question. Uh, so I, I 
will say that I do have solar on my house, and, and I'm actually on the, the older program, which was the FIT, the FIT program. Um, I still get funds for set power. I send out funds that come back in. You're mentioning the AMI meters, so these are new meters that are going to be going out. Do you have a, uh, a timeline for sending those to everybody in the community? Or is that just going to be on a replacement type basis for when these new meters are going to no, be going it's out? Going to be, yeah, no, we're going, everybody's going to get one. Uh, the timeline, David probably has a better idea, or Eric does. Okay. So it's, it's about two years. About two years. They're going to replace every water, electric, and gas. Right, and just so y'all know, even though it's two years, how long y'all been planning and asking? and pushing and writing. <laughs> so it's a lot that goes into that system. Go ahead, man. Okay, so I, I, I was just, does anybody have any other questions about solar? Because I was gonna move on, you just. I know um, in the legislation, they are considering eliminating net metering. Do you have any updates on that? I didn't, well, I, I know the, some utilities don't like it. I'm not aware of anything like that, yeah. There, um, so, <coughs> Municipals are permitted to set up their own guidelines for these programs. Right. JRU has provided a fairly generous net metering program, while if you go up to JEA, they've got net billing. So anything you push on in J for JEA, now that, that, that energy now belongs to them. And if you want to buy it back from them, you're going to buy it at retail. They're buying it from you at, at basically wholesale, what they call avoided costs. They sell it back. And the way they sort of cushioned the blow of that, because they did have a net metering problem, a, a program, they decided to come up with a very generous battery rebate. So basically saying to the customer, well, if you want your own electricity, you can save it and keep it yourself. Now, we are the battery here in Gainesville. That's why it's, it's less expensive for Gainesville uh, residents to, to set up these solar systems, because you don't need a battery. The only thing that a battery really provides for us here is emergency backup. A lot of people uh, during the hurricane system had a root awakening and they found out their PV system does not work when our grid goes down. The PV system goes down too. The PV system is looking to the grid for a signal that it syncs with. And as soon as that signal is gone, the inverter is told to shut down and that prevents the islanding of these things. That way, our, our uh, technicians, the linemen, can get out there and address these down lines without the fear of them being energized. So we, we, we talk about the solar panels and stuff like that, the solar energy use. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, is, is there some kind of program or has it been any kind of talk um, about like neighborhood solar energy fields or something like that? Yes, we covered that in, um, I think right before you came. Oh, and so after afterwards, go talk to Mr. Wheeler. Okay. Um, and there was somebody else. Was it you? Talking about community. So yeah, Eric yeah, so actually is the supply Eric. side. Of yeah, yeah, there you go. That, that's, that's who we talked to for those follow up. Back so some other programs that we have in uh, energy and business services is the LEAP program. You might be aware of that. It's the Low Income Energy Efficiency Program. Um, our department tries to get out to 100 houses every year to address these houses. Their own uh, home, houses that are owned by the occupants, uh, they're older houses, older stock houses, and they're owned by a, uh, their homeowner is at or below a threshold for low income. And if they meet all those criteria, we go out there, we look around the house, we try to determine what would be the best investment in this house in order to bring down this person's utility bill. And uh, often that turns out to be the air conditioner. And air conditioners in, you know, in our community, it's not just comfort, it's health and safety too. If your air conditioner's out, your house might fill up with mold, or it might just be sweltering in the house and very dangerous for our older residents at that time. So we've changed that over a thousand ACs through the program. We've addressed over 2,200 houses since that program began. It's still going strong. Uh, we accept about 100 people into that program every year. Uh, they s generally, on, on, a, uh, on a monthly basis, they see about a $20 reduction in their bill. 
Any questions on the lead? Lead was one of the persons I mentioned earlier. Lead was, again, CWC. The City Commission recently directed the UAB to study conservation programs, and I would encourage you to talk to your commissioners about increasing funding for LEAP and for CWC. Uh, this is something the UAB is going to be looking at and discussing. And also, I've been asking the City Commission and GRC too to remove some of the requirements. Um, at a certain point, I know some of us live in what we call heirs' property, and so a large portion of these houses that needs to be done are heirs' property. The problem with a lot of our programs, and that's across the board, any program, um, is they don't typically serve heirs' property. Too many owners, too much with the whatever. And so for me, when it comes to something like our utilities, the safety of our homes, those type of things, then that barrier shouldn't be a consideration. Especially since the LEAP program right now, yes, it needs more funding, but the funding that it does get, and so everybody that needs that program should be able to use it regardless of what their um, circumstances are in the house. Yes, ma'am. I just want to be clear on what is considered low income. Is that the federal poverty guidelines? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 80%. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. So to that, I believe the community redevelopment has developed a form and are working through um, some logistics on how to provide customers with heirs property the ability to get a Absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely a situation that we've been working through, not just here, and housing programs and across the board, because they don't typically qualify for nothing. And a, lot, the, a large portion of the infrastructure that's failing belong to these families and they need to, and what happens is they lose the generational wealth and the family wealth because a lot of times that house and that land is a part of their wealth, right? And so if they can't maintain it, nobody can live in it, they typically wind up selling that property when all we have to do is get them a new roof and some windows. So just to sum on your point there, I do work for the DPRA for the city uh, and we are working on getting out a heirs program to help clear up the legal ownership of the property for people. So hopefully in the next month or two, that program should go live. We're waiting on getting uh, the legal contractors in place for that to do the uh, research and be able to help with that. And also, I'm also encouraging families to sit down with each other and make decisions about who owns it. Because at the end of the day, heirs' property is a national issue. It's not something that we can handle locally. And so it comes to one thing, put it in one person's name. That's going to be the bottom line. And so starting programs and having legal assistance so we're able to facilitate that for people is going to be a good way. But if we can get it to our family and say, listen, find the most responsible child you got, give it to them, and y'all work together to keep on the house. And that's what we've been encouraging folks. So you had anything else, Tim? Um, I could wrap it up there. If you like. Okay. All right. That sounds uh, good. Unless anybody has any questions. Because I know the, the last part, any, any other questions? The last part is probably um, going to be um, conversation heavy or question heavy. Um, so I'm just going to get Eric. He came up um, a little while ago to just answer some questions, but now he's going to give us some information. And you're doing renewable? renewables? Yep, on renewables. Okay. So, so it'll add some more of our conversations, okay? Okay. So I'm going to use this handout as kind of my agenda of what I'm going to talk about. So we can follow along on that. But first off, a little bit about my background. I have a, I've been with Trailer about 18 years, um, and I have a mechanical engineering degree. My first 10 years of, was, of that was working in the plants, uh, the generation plants for GRU. So I, I, I learned how to make the power, right? A portion of that was also increasing efficiency and measurement efficiency in those plants. And so now my job, a lot of it, is actually minimizing the cost, the day to day cost of serving. Part of that is what we're going to talk about today is renewable and how that all folds in. So when we talk about renewable, a lot of people may ask the question, well, what does renewable mean? Renewable means you are fueling or you are creating energy from a source that does not run out. Okay? So if you think about the sun, as long as there's life on this planet, the sun will be there. And so it, it doesn't quote unquote run out. If you're think, uh, talking about um, wind, right? It blows. As long as we have air on this planet, it's going to move, and that's going to cause wind. And so that power is going to be something that won't run out. That fuel source won't run out. There's only a couple of things that are considered really renewable, generally. So you've got wind, you've got solar, you've got biomass, which we have.
Talk a little bit as well. Um, we have hydro and geothermal, and there's some debate whether wave energy, using energy from the ocean, is considered renewable as well, right? So those are really the main things that we have. Guess how many of those six that we have available here in Gainesville? We have two. We have solar and we have biomass. And that's it, really. So when we talk about renewable and how it fits into our system, we have to consider where we are in the nation, what renewable resources we have, and how we can implement those in a cost-effective way, okay? So when we jump into this policy, uh, the first part is diversification of energy sources. And it talks about optimizing the use of Deer Haven Renewable, which is our biomass plant, and reducing uh, the, the uh, use of Deer Haven 1 and Deer Haven 2 and Kelly by 2045. So Deer Haven 1 and 2 are natural gas and coal, and Kelly is natural gas as well. So what this is basically saying is we're trying to, to optimize or increase the use of, of renewable from DHR and decrease the use of the others. So we committed, the city is committed to a goal of net zero greenhouse emissions by 2045. And DHR is going to play a large part in that. So what does net zero mean? Okay. If you think about a scale, and I talk with my hands. If you tie my hands, I can't talk, so I'm going to use them. Um, when you talk about a scale, right, it has two sides and they're balanced, okay? Um, net zero basically means that any emissions that you have on one side weighs down that scale. Net zero means you have to remove emissions or cause emissions to be not emitted on the other side to bring that scale back in balance, okay? So the more you emit on this side, the more you have to cause to not be emitted on this side. That could be replacing generation with solar, that could be planting trees, that could be a number of things to balance that out. And so our goal as a city is to be net zero, have both of these sides balanced, emissions, versus causation to not be emitted to equal, okay? And that's basically what we're saying when we say net zero. Um, and so our goal is to do that by 2045, okay? Now, the plan to do that is still in development, because like I said, we only basically have two options here in Gainesville. How do we make that work? How do we implement and balance the cost for that so that people's bills don't go up exorbitantly more questions so far? All right, I'm going to keep moving then. So energy, uh, renewable energy portfolio, plan, budget, and implement uh, programs that achieve, it says 100% renewable, but it should be net zero. Uh, energy portfolio and in incremental stages. Why are increments important? Number one, it saves money. Because you're not doing a whole bunch of, spending a whole bunch of money up front to, to do it all at once. Not only that, but it allows the technology to evolve. And I'm going to ask a question here. I have something in my pocket. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah. Yeah. Looks like an iPod. It's, a, it's an iPod, but it's basically the same size and shape oh, as the see. original iPhone. Okay? Oh, wow. Now, this phone came out. We're going to call it a phone. It's the same shape and size. The iPhone came out in 2007. When it came out, everyone said it was light years ahead of everything else. It literally turned the cell phone industry on its ear. Nobody had ever seen anything like it before, and everybody else scrambled to catch up, right? Revolutionary technology. Who in here has an iPhone today? You have an iPhone? Let's trade. Do you want to trade this for yours? Why not? It's, it's too small. I can barely see it, right? But why else? It's obsolete, right? You can't possibly think to pick this up and do business today like you do on your current iPhone, right? So, generation technology is a lot, a lot like that, okay? When you take technology that's revolutionary in 2007, and you say, I'm going to buy it and I'm going to use it for the next 30 years. This don't work today. Right. You mean I got to use this another 15 years? Hold up, that's not going to work, right? So what increments does 
is it allows you to take advantage of the advances in technology as they come along. It lowers your cost, but it also allows you in the future, as things progress, as they get more efficient, as they use energy less, as they emit less, it now allows you to jump on those and say, yes, I'm going to use this technology for a portion of it. And you keep doing that in increments until you eventually replace your portfolio at a lower cost and better technology. Now, if I were a business and I said in 2007, I'm going to take my whole phone business for the next 20, budget for the next 20 years and buy iPhone, best thing on the market. Well, all of my employees will be screaming at me right now because this doesn't work. I spent a whole bunch of money on something that does not work now. It's, it's less efficient. It costs me more to maintain, right? Same idea in the generation system. You buy it all at once, you do it all right now, you have a high cost, but eventually down the line, there's better technology, better things that help you meet that goal, but now you can't take advantage of it because you've already spent all this money up front. Does that make sense? That's an idea of techno technological advancement that we have to be able to take advantage of as a utility, as a community, okay? This is my kids. They play with this right now, so that's why it, it did not work. They think they're doing something, they're really not. Um, next part is climate disruption and planning. So the city of Gainesville will study and plan for likely impacts of climate change. Um, that means what, what we're going to do is prepare for impacts of climate change, for severe weather, for needed utilities. And what that looks like is a couple of things, right? It looks like hardening of things, reinforcing things, so when hurricanes or floods or natural disasters come through, the system and the grid can actually maintain and, and work through that. So it looks like resiliency or redundancy, having backups for things, right? And that if you lose one, you have an ultimate, a alternate way to get power to a home. You can reroute it. Instead of having one line, you'll have two. Now, does that cost you a little more? Yeah. But are you appreciative of that if a hurricane comes through and you're out for a day instead of 10 days? Yes. Okay? Now, there's a balance to that as well. But that's part of what we're looking at as far as this energy policy goes. And the last part is fuel supply. You're to maintain a status of fuel diverse. And uh, as it transitions to 100% uh, renewable, again, reading net zero energy by 2045. And why is it important? Um, when you have multiple ways to make energy, multiple fuel sources, those fuel sources ultimately cost different things, right? One could be a dollar, one could be five dollars, and one could be eight dollars. Well, if you want me to make the cheapest energy, I gotta have access to that, that, that fuel that costs a dollar because that's gonna keep your cost the lowest, right? There are certain times where that fuel type isn't available, so now I've got to switch to another kind of fuel, okay? And we do that to try to minimize costs. If we don't have one fuel type for the power plants and the natural gas system, and I understand very well how much changes in cost affect your energy price. I can look at it in real time and say, because this fuel price is going up, your cost of energy just went up by, by that same amount, okay? So fuel diversity is very important. Not only for that previous point of resiliency, having options, having redundancy, but also as the price of fuel changes uh, and those, those things fluctuate, we can still help to minimize costs. Any questions? Don't you ease your hand up and don't put it on the okay. uh, Earlier, you said you were talking about um, the renewable rate sources that you have available um, to us in Florida. And when? We don't have. I mean, we don't have. I'm just saying, but I'm going to ask about that. When? I want to ask you. Okay. So there's multiple parts of that question. I want to make sure that I'm answering those for you. You, you realize that when you're sharing your bill, you're not just paying for electricity. You're paying for electric, water, wastewater, sometimes right. trash service as taxes. So you, you got to quantify what's all in that bill, right? But on a general note, our electric prices are higher than someone that says Clay Electric is only an electric provider. So we got to make sure we portion out the part that is electric and compare that to Clay Electric. Okay. Um, I, I work for the city, but I am not a fan of being PC. Um, but I'm going to tell you why your bill is higher. Okay. Um, GRU and the city of Gainesville have decided they're going to 
really leaders in that renewable cost money. Right? That cost is more than your bill. All right? And so there are benefits for renewable and, and environmental benefits that we cannot ignore. But the fact of the matter is they cost money. And so that is reflected in that bill. When you look at Clay Electric, they get all of their power from Seminole Electric. Okay? What they have generally in their portfolio is natural gas, combined cycle, and coal. Okay? They have clean coal, which means they clean up the emissions. But those, in general, are cheaper than the mix that we have. They're also building newer units, which have a lower cost of generation power, which GRU has not done in a while. Now, we've upgraded and we've you know, tried to, to do those things for lower cost, but it's not on the same effect of new technology. A generator built 20 years ago is not going to be as efficient or as a generator built five years ago. Plain and simple, right? So those are the things that play into it. So even though we have fuel diversity, we are leaders in the state, and I mean by far. So GRU is, is about 20% renewable if you look nominally. No one else in the state is above five, okay? Not that being environmentally responsible is a bad thing, but it costs money. And so we have to balance that. And that's why I say balance. Because should we be environmental stewards? Absolutely. There is no question about that. But how do you balance that with the cost of a bill, someone that, has, that is on a fixed income, and make sure that their bill doesn't double because of the cost of electricity, right? So there are multiple things that go into that. And like I said, I work for the city, but I'm going to tell you the truth. That's why. That's a large, large percentage of why that is. Older generation, older technology, early investment in renewable, it costs. And the other part of that is when we compare our cost of electric, we I encourage people to compare us to the same type of company. When you compare us to somebody like Clay Electric, Clay Electric has the privilege of taking their profits and putting them in their pocket. GRU doesn't have that privilege. GRU had to generate $36 million for the city, regardless. So that means if they're $22 million short, they got to go in reserve because city of Gainesville won't 36. So when we lower the bills, when we lower the utilities, and that thing, it saves the company, saves our clients money, but we lose money. But the city of Gainesville is saying, yeah, we don't care what your laws do, we save money, we still need 36 million. And we don't always have it. So we start to deplete reserves, and then we have to build those back up in order to maintain a positive portfolio so that we can continue to get financing and that type of thing to run the utility. And like you said, a lot of our energy, our um, plants and stuff, our tech, a lot of that stuff is old. And so we have to keep up our reserve accounts because should that go down, they're not sitting on the shelf at Home Depot. You feel me? So they have to be put all these measures to be prepared. So whenever we, but I can tell you, whenever you compare our rates here, compare them to public owned utilities that also have a responsibility to their city. And these, then see where they compare because we're never gonna compare to Clay Electric, for one, they're only electric company. We're not gonna compare to Duke Energy, they only provide energy. And those are private companies you can pocket for. So they can tell you, hey, we buy GRU, we're gonna cut your bill in half, and they can very well do that. But then the city of Gainesville has to decide, now we need to go after the property taxes because we still need $36 million. So now as people are lining up back in front of us, we're starting to lose our homes because we can't pay taxes. You feel me? So it's, it is a vicious cycle. Yes, we need to get on this. Well, I do appreciate uh, the explanation because I never had that explained. So that expresses this. And property taxes is another issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of a lot of it's a lot of moving parts. Again, let's start getting in front of our commission and telling them they need to figure this out for us. <laughs> they can't just keep piling on it to be our responsibility. They have to give us some keys and answers to figure out how they replace that there. And, and it's not working with uh, GRU and having to give the commissioners having to say a whole lot about it. Yes, ma'am. You want to share uh, Wheeler? Yes, if I may. Uh, I appreciate Eric's presentation, and it really hit the nail on the head. We've invested in environmental technology. We're planning ahead, 
and other folks who have lower rates are going to have a rude surprise, a rude shock a few years down the road. Natural gas prices are escalating, coal is escalating. <coughs> We're planning ahead and doing this in stages, and no one likes high rates. I don't like high rates, but we are planning. We're staging this, and there are a lot of a lot of costs that that GRU is is avoiding that don't get accounted for in these rates. I mean, we have a cleaner environment. It's better for the folks who live here. And it's just, it's a long-term plan and you got to do a little bit here, a little bit there. I'd also like to follow up on Eric's comment about incrementalism. That's an important argument, but it's also a tricky one. You know, I, I appreciate the analogy about the, the iPad, but we can't use incrementalism to, to push off investing in our future now. If we did that, we'd all be happy. We still have flip phones instead of the, the iPods now. So we need to start investing now a little bit at a time, a little bit here. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I appreciate that comment. But I think to her point, that is exactly what he said. And he led to all of that. It still not, doesn't take away from the fact that we are having to provide that. Oh, yeah. And the city and other people need to do something different. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to rates, while I do see, I mean, that's any business. How many of y'all can still go back? Do McDonald's still have a 99 cent menu? Mm -mm. <laughs> you no, know why? Because gas changed. So that 99 cent hamburger is $1.39. So as a businesswoman, I can understand the reason. My problem with the company and with the changing of the rates is for the most vulnerable. Yes, it's important that we get ahead to it, but everybody can't come along and we're not doing enough to make sure that we can bring everybody along. So we need to, like he said, do things in increments. Absolutely. But sometimes we, as a commission, and I know we, we make the recommendation, the commission makes the decision, but we as a commission, as we're changing those rates and needing to keep us healthy, we got to remember that we also have investors that we need to make sure is healthy too. Oh, um, Wendell, you wanted to say something, and then we're yeah. going to wrap up, because we're doing so good at time. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, for you your know, staff, you Mr. Know, Carl, I hate to ever disagree with you, did, but you, you did call out one point I got to. Uh, last time I checked, Duke Power actually has higher rates than we do. Okay. So, again, uh, <laughs> we might well, be well, at maybe, high rates in the state, but we got some investor owned people that are even worse. So, again, be careful where you live and, and God bless King. And right, and I don't, I typically don't look at the other companies. I try to make sure that the city of Gainesville is not using this, using our community in a way that is detrimental to them. And so I never looked that, at that. That's all right, I'm just joking. I just want you all to compare oranges to oranges and apples to apples, Ms. Kendra, and, and, and then you. Uh, I think that Eric did a phenomenal job. Did. Yes. And I think that's where there may be this breakdown or this gap. It's just why. The why is what needs to be explained. Right. And so when people understand why, you know, then we can move on to the next phase. And as we're already seeing in Tideville, President, somebody must be getting a raise down there. You know, they generate all these other comments when there really is a strategy in place. You know, there's a reason why. And I think that's the piece of the education that's getting out there and explaining. We can't compare ourselves with Clay Electric or all these other places. Has Mark GRE ever considered being independently owned and ran? People may have had those questions, but I think that's going to be the key in the long run is being able to say, this is what we're doing, this is our why. Exactly, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm, I'm on Facebook Live and one of the things were like, we just need to vote GRU out and give us a brand new electric company. Mm -hmm. And so when you have those type of dynamics, just like Ms. Aubrey said, that is when ed education comes in play. Because once you do that, if you got rid of the public owned utility and we privatize it everywhere, we still gonna be responsible for $36 million tax okay. Now we're gonna figure out high taxes, property taxes, whatever it is, that is the dynamic of living here, where you have a GSP. Yeah. Uh -uh, she was next, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanna ask, now that we're moving to um, the electric car, and how is that going to affect the homeowner? Because now we're not going to be buying gas. We'll be paying for the electric part of the car to basically charge it. So I would like to know more education on that because that's what we're moving to. So I want to hear more about EVs. Yeah. Okay. 
Can I connect her with you after? Sure. Okay, because that, that's the, um, when we're on the UAB, that's our EV um, person. He wants us all to have electric vehicles that night today. <laughs> so <laughs> he probably has a plan. <laughs> and the UAB is going to be studying that. We're looking at ways to encourage folks and to help them make their transition. Yeah. Uh, things like to have rebates or an incentive or maybe even a certain kind of use rate where you can charge at a lower rate. So uh, EVs happen. The question is, how do we prepare? How do we get folks involved? Right. Right. Well, as for this girl, I want me a '65 Mustang with a carburetor. So, <laughs> y'all, y'all, I, I like it. Yes, ma'am. I like classic cars. I won't be going electric. And, and you can put that on everything. Doesn't have a chip in it. So, ma'am, we won't have a chip in it. You hear me? Okay. So, um, in fact, <laughs> I can tell you this, and and I don't know about the dynamic of the electrical vehicle. But I do know, as somebody who owns a 2018 that had to buy something as regular as a battery, my battery is $300 because it cranks up by itself. It does this, it does all these features that I love until it's time to do maintenance. And so as we're bringing everybody along, we have to look at the whole picture, making sure we educate people about what the cost is, not what the cost of the vehicle, and we are going to have to plug it up. But how do you maintain that, pass that? Because everybody's not going to come every time you cover it down. So they don't have a program for that. So as we're, and then when you come out with new processes like electrical vehicles and stuff like that, they're just not, they haven't been along enough for me, for, for me to believe that. They, and this is just me talking. I support whoever wants to get an electrical vehicle. But even with some of these GPS systems, when I'm still looking at how people are hacking into these systems and stuff like that, I, I, I don't consider electrical vehicle. We want to make sure that people that want to get it. Get a question first. Well, I think he was saying, well, he can wait. I'll wait. Mine was more of, of a comment thing, and because I was listening to some of the stuff and, 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 and then knowing that we are the owners of GRU, we as the residents for the most part, but then, and then they do have the different types of services and programs that are available. For people that, but no, normally for folks that are, are, are low income and so forth. But I was thinking that you know a, a lot of us are all paying that same tax that are that's going into the city tax portion to help subsidize those different programs and so forth. But there, there are many people that are not able to access it a little bit. Right. So I think that it needs to be some type of way to make sure that the money that are being paid in by every citizen is being able to be able to be accessed by every citizen. But then not only that, um, with the raising of rates and so forth, I think some people wouldn't consider it as a raise in rate if also with the raise in rate, there's some type of uh, something built in place to make sure that some of the citizens who are not, who don't have homes that are upgraded to the point that it needs to be upgraded to, can have some kind of way to access it so that as we bring on these new um, uh, processes as far as for electricity, that these homes will be able to actually um, access the same type of capability to, to, to hold the loads in the house. Because there are some houses that can't. Um, stand or uh, upgrade, want to upgrade the systems and the lines and so forth. But I think if the citizens knew that with the increase of their rate also would come some help of upgrading stuff at the home, which would then in turn make the whole system all the way around work better, um, which I, I know that would be something a long ways down the road, but we, we need to consider that as, as well when we consider and, and restructuring and re revamping uh, our sy system um, not just on the, the electrical system, but also the processes that causes the people to be able to access the systems as well. And that's a I don't good, know if that makes sense or not. That, that's a good point. And I, I know that we have leads and we have CWC, but everybody is not low income, one. We got some retired teachers and people who are retired who still can't afford it. They don't fit this little category right here. And we don't have programs for everybody. So when we start talking about moving people forward, we got to realize that we got some more work to do on this side. And it's a good point that you made. I remember a while back, I was one of the ones, right before I joined the UAB, and I was looking at all these upgrades to the 
infrastructure in the bottom and, and they were putting more and I was thinking on our side of town the water pressure is horrible, right? And then I started looking at the dynamic. When I started serving on the UAB and started talking to Tony and other ones, then I started learning, well, you know, we can't push all that power over there because they pipe so. Now, you're the homeowner. It's not my job as GRU to upgrade mm -hmm. your pipe. So as a UAB member, I have to go back to Tara Thomas and Mr. Shepherd and ask them, can we have some kind of program so we can include that? That's what takes the time. So even though we know sometimes that we need to make some changes, it takes a while to get that done. And then it bounces back and forth. Yes, and I guess that's just my point, is bringing out the parents of the guidelines. Because, I mean, you pretty much have to be starving in the meeting. Yeah. Okay, you do. And it's like you're saying, you have individuals who, you know, you're in a home on the east side of town, you may have old And who have done well not to be in that poverty. Exactly, you know, <laughs> work hard, hard time to be doing there. well, but you still need are that. paying yeah. $600 a month or for a utility bill, or, you know, you live in an apartment. Let's say if you live in an apartment, so like, this is what just surprise my teeth. You got someone living in an apartment. Let's say they're paying a thousand dollars a month for rent, but your utility bill is six hundred. Mm -hmm. We call that the cost of home. People say the cost of home got to do with how much it costs. It's how much it costs to maintain that house exactly. that matters. And that 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 sixteen hundred dollars doesn't include them eating, driving, being clothed, fed. Lord have mercy, if you got a franchise, you want to buy a joint. And, and, and you ain't making eight fifty an hour. Right. And so and and all of it's off balance. So yeah. for me, that is one of the reasons why I had a difficult time with rate increases. Although I understand them, thank you. Although I understand them. I don't vote at any time to do them until they figure out this piece. And so, um, but they, again, they have the final say, and they're gonna do what it takes to make them a government, um, healthy and whole. Uh, we're gonna take one last question. I, I, no, for my, no, this table right here is awesome. I had some awards to give out. I, right here. I got to look short. Somebody in the house with a statement. Can y'all hear me talking? A little bit. A little bit. Uh, just starting off with a statement about just transition to renewables. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the elephant on the wall, environmental risk, because our society has a history of placing facilities in brown, black and brown communities. That's one thing. But on the other side of it, we still have an opportunity to be on the right side of history and have environmental justice which means that one area of our county or of our city does not bear the burden of green energy. So my question is, to also to the GRU staff and our wonderful leaders from UAB, um, how do we put this in policy to have a just transition for renewables? What's your commission? Who, who else has, has another? Since answer? we don't have any commissioners here today. Yeah. I'm talking to these three. Yep. We are working at that through lots of different programs. Um, we need to do more. Absolutely. But uh, one of the things I've been hammering away at today is the conservation programs. I think I see conservation and renewables as two sides of the same coin. And we need to increase funding for both. We need things are going to get a lot uglier from here on out. Global climate change is happening. Fuel costs are going up. Everything's getting more expensive. And it's, there aren't going to be any easy answers. But we got to make sure that everybody gets addressed. And Carlos did a great job of bringing it up today. Everybody, every neighborhood, we need to go forward. Placement of a solar facility, that's difficult. Because you have to have a large area of land that's high and dry. And there are only so many areas in Electric County. We need to balance that with social equity. With racial equity, but we need to find a way to make it happen and get everybody involved in what Carla's doing today, the way that is making that happen by having workshops like this. As a UAB chair, I want to see a lot more conservation happen, to go with a lot more renewables on top of that, and working to bring in EVs. So that each of these are little components. Uh, Eric Sacramentalism, we need to do these in steps and bring each one of these steps along. And that's just my, my preference. I, I can't speak for the other UAB members or for staff, 
Can I speak as a UAB member? One of the ways that if you're asking how do we get all of that he just said into policy, um, part of it is one, us working on it through a workshop to try to get it to be suggested to the city commission. They're the ones that kind of, they, they typically, things typically work the other way around. They come and say, hey, we need you guys to create an energy policy. And then we go and we work and we work to create that energy policy. But there can be an opportunity to say, hey, we had this workshop and one of the persons want us to look at doing a social um, environmental justice type policy. And then Kwanda Ja and other people are working through the NAACP for that um, to be done. And so one of the ways is just what you just did now. Hey, I raised this concern to the UAP members and I expect them to do their due diligence and follow up. I just have a comment to go back to your point when we were asking how did we get there. I just want to make a couple of suggestions mm -hmm. and put them on the record. And then we're um, gonna, you're going to be last comment. I, too. Okay, great. Okay. okay, because we live in Southwest Philosophical County and we have been impacted in our small community because we have a lot of land out west. Okay, I'm from the Southwest area. So I would like you all, city commission, whoever, and the county to consider doing a vulnerability, vulnerability impact assessment when you start spreading or wanting to uh, build these bridges in areas that may have a huge landmass which you will need. Also you need to have a community benefits agreement. How is this going to impact, influence, help, hurt, whatever, these communities that you're going into. Talk to the people. Find out, don't talk at them. Now, that's what these social companies, these third party companies that are hired, they come to our community starting to tell us what's best for us. My family's been on my land for 100 years. Uh -huh. I think I know what's best for us, okay? But you're gonna have this outside energy coming and telling me, like, we don't understand solar. Let me explain it to you. Well, we are not as uh, ill-advised as you may think on solar. I think by this conversation we're having here, we do know what we're talking about and how it will impact our community. And also, what siting criteria? I think that's something that needs to be addressed. It needs to be spelled out in a out in a plan. What is going to be your criteria for siting these plants wherever you're going to site them? Another thing I would like you all to entertain too is an energy justice scorecard. If there's five questions, there's several out there, but the one in particular, there's five questions. You can overlay that on any policy. We're going to just talk about solar right now or renewable energy. But if you ask those five questions to the community, and then ask those five questions to your governmental entity, then you will have community engagement. Thank you so much. And on that note, we are going to end this forum. I can just tell you um, this on, on the final note. Member, Member Lewis, if I may, I have got so much credit today, which if anybody knows me, know I like that. I'm not going to be lying. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, it would be proper if I did not say that co putting this together with you and I, with David Warren. David is like the pimp today, and he really should be glad, so I want to be right. I just, I mean, I think you're robbery if I don't at least acknowledge David Warren. And, and I agree. <laughs> and God knows, remember Lewis and I, we don't mind playing glass. We, we don't, we really don't. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that, sorry. Thank you, Yvette, and, and on that note, it's a lot that just went, went into in, in the beginning. This event was not GRU responding saying, yeah, we'll help you throw together something. I grabbed some snacks and that was it. Yvette and I met 